And uh, it being Friday, it is Brunch with Bernie Day. Senator Bernie Sanders, I think of him as America's senator, but the uh, good people of Vermont know that he is uh, 100% their senator. And my call screening software is booting. It'll take me just a second. And there we go. Senator Sanders. Whoop, here we go. Senator Sanders, welcome. Good to be with you, Tom. <laughs> Great to have you. I'm sorry for that delay. I, I, I run back here and click the button. Uh, yesterday, the farm bill went down in flames. Everybody is, you know, the, the, the chattering class are all talking about the Republican Party being in disarray. I suspect not. What are your thoughts on this? No, I don't think they're in disarray. I think they're doing exactly what they want to be doing. Uh, you got a bunch of folks there whose job in life is to protect the wealthy and the powerful, uh, who want to cut back on Social Security or privatize it, cut back, and Medicare as we know it, make devastating cuts in Medicaid, senior programs, education. Uh, these guys think that the function of government is to protect the military and to protect the wealthy, uh, and they don't want to do much else. They don't want to protect family farmers. They don't certainly don't want to make sure that, that kids in this country and seniors get the nutrition that they need. Most of the food stamp program, which uh, they had proposed to cut by over uh, twenty billion dollars. I guess that wasn't enough for some of those guys. Uh, goats food stamp program goes to working families with kids, uh, to the elderly. That's where most of the food stamp money goes. And, and as poverty remains very, very high in this country, uh, those folks need those programs. So I don't see that the Republicans are dysfunctional. I, I think they're doing exactly what they want to do. And in many ways, they are winning. Uh, the middle class is disappearing. Poverty is very high. The wealthy are doing phenomenally well. Corporate profits are off the wall. Uh, tax rates for the rich and corporate corporations are low. So these guys, you know, they know what their mission is, and, and uh, they are succeeding. So that it doesn't surprise me, but obviously we need a farm bill, and I hope that uh, we can do one. Uh, right now, as you know, to, to change subjects, we are uh, on an immigration bill in the Senate. And regardless of what happens, the Senate remains to be seen whether the House is able to do anything or wants to do anything about a serious issue. Uh, my own view is that the immigration bill uh, has a number of very important provisions in it. Uh, I think we do need a path toward citizenship for 11 million people in this country who are here illegally. Uh, I think we do need to support the DREAM Act, the kids of people uh, who came uh, over the border. Uh, I think we certainly need to deal with farm labor in this country uh, and give them legal status. It's a very serious problem, but I'll tell you, uh, Tom, I have some very, very serious concerns uh, about uh, one aspect of the bill, which has not gotten a whole lot of attention, that is these guest worker programs. And the bottom line here is you have the high-tech companies spending a whole lot of money, uh, and what they're saying is we need to import into this country hundreds of thousands of high-tech workers uh, in, in, into our companies. Uh, and their argument is there simply are not enough American workers who are capable of doing uh, those jobs. And bottom line is, I don't believe that. Uh, I think there are some instances where you have specialized work that people in a given geographical area may not be able to do, and companies should have the right to bring people from abroad in. Uh, but I think they over-exaggerate the problem. There's a problem. I think they over-exaggerate it. And I think they want to flood the market with foreign uh, uh, high-tech workers who work for lower wages than American workers. And I, uh, given the fact that unemployment in this country continues to be very, very high, uh, can, while it is going down, we've made progress in the last five years, real unemployment, counting those people who have given up looking for work and those people who are working part-time, is almost 14%. If you are an African-American, if you're a young person, the numbers are substantially higher. Uh, so before we uh, open the doors to foreign workers uh, and guest worker programs, I think we want to make sure that American workers get the jobs that they need. Now that's high tech stuff. Then you got low tech. Uh, uh, then you got entry level work. People don't know that in this bill, you're looking at hundreds again, uh, opening the door to hundreds of thousands of workers who are going to work at McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts and Burger King. They're going to work in resorts. They're going to work as lifeguards. They're going to work as waiters and waitresses and dishwashers. And I just, uh, at a time when, when youth unemployment is very, very high, when a lot of kids trying to save a few bucks to go to college, it bothers me immensely uh, that the jobs that are out there, entry-level jobs that these kids could take, that I did when I was going to college, 
uh, to make a few bucks uh, may not be there for them. Uh, and uh, what I'm even more troubled by is you got just a whole lot of kids in this country who are never going to go to college, and that's fine. Uh, they graduated high school. And you know what? It is very, very hard for them to get a job. I was in Detroit a couple of weeks ago, uh, and the kids there are able to get jobs in fast food uh, restaurants, McDonald's, etc. They can't even get 40 hours a week. They're getting 30 hours a week, 20 hours a week at $7.25 an hour. Uh, and do we want those kids to be competing against people from around the world in various programs called the J-1 program, guest worker program, those are college students from abroad coming in, 100,000 of those guys, uh, or the H-2B program, more uh, low-wage workers coming into this country? I think not. Now, what I'm working on is, at the very least, I'm trying to change those programs. And needless to say, corporate America is not very happy about that. But at the very, very, very least, what I want is a jobs program uh, for our young people. And we've introduced an amendment uh, for a billion and a half dollars for a two-year program that would provide about 400,000 uh, summer and uh, uh, year-round uh, employment opportunities for young people. Uh, and uh, I hope very much that at the very least that gets passed because I, it, it, it's a serious problem and we've got to address it. So um, that's an issue that's on the floor. I'm chairman of the uh, subcommittee that looks at um, uh, senior issues. Uh, we are working on the Older Americans Act. Uh, the Older Americans Act is not as well known, obviously, as Medicare and Medicaid, but it's a very important provision uh, signed by Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s. And what it does is it's the program that funds Meals on Wheels, uh, which is the uh, nutrition program that provides meals to uh, very frail seniors who can't leave their homes, funds what's called the Congregate Meal Program, which is funding for senior center meal programs, uh, funds employment programs for seniors, very, very important issue. It's been underfunded for years. And what we find with seniors, if they are isolated, if they're alone, if they're not getting good nutrition, and a whole lot of seniors are, are struggling with very, very serious economic problems, uh, what happens is, you know, they get, if you're not eating well, you're going to end up uh, getting sicker more often. You're going to end up in the emergency room. You're going to end up in the hospital. And it costs a lot more money to keep people in the hospital for preventable illnesses, uh, keep them, uh, uh, take care of them in the emergency room than it does to provide decent nutrition. So we are asking for a significant increase uh, in this program. We got, I think, 18 co-sponsors on board uh, this, and uh, we're going to try to get some Republican support for it. But I think it's a very good investment. It's the morally right thing to do. You can't turn your back on the people who have worked hard to make this country great, who have fought in our wars, who have raised us, uh, and who need help right now. Other issue that we're working on is I'm on both the uh, Energy and Environmental Committees, and I'm working with the chairman of those committees. Barbara Boxer is chair of the Environmental Committee, and uh, Barbara and I are working on um, very strong global warming legislation, which would impose a carbon fee on major carbon polluters in America, and raise a whole lot of money, uh, and disincentivize the use of carbon. Uh, right now, the scientists around the world and others are telling us that um, we are looking at a very dangerous situation, that we need to transform our energy system away from carbon into uh, energy efficiency and sustainable energy, and uh, we're going to try to make that happen. Spectacular. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie, hour, our national town hall meeting with Senator Sanders taking your calls. We'll be back with Senator Bernie Sanders right after this. This is the Tom Hartman Program. Check out Bernie's website, by the way, sanders.senate.gov. You can sign up for his newsletter, The Bernie Buzz, and there's always a, a great stack of information there. And welcome back. Uh, let's see here. Burl in Sierra Vista, Arizona. You are, and thanks for watching Free Speech TV on the DISH Satellite TV Network. You are on the air with Senator Sanders. Well, thank you, Senator Sanders, for taking my call. Um, there's a friend of mine who is dealing with leukemia, 
and her oncologist has been trying to get her into some clinical trials. Yesterday she met with that doctor who told her that the three clinical trials he was trying to get her into have been canceled because of the sequester. I'm just wondering if there's any movement in Congress on trying to override the sequester or do away with it, and also if there's anything going on to try and let the public know better about what the Republicans are doing. I know Tom does this frequently, which is one of the reasons I'm a big fan of his show. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Beryl, and that is a heartbreaking story. Uh, Sequestration has had a very significant impact on a lot of people's lives, and Beryl reminds us or tells us about, obviously, one tragic situation here. Uh, and there are many others. Uh, what sequestration is about is cuts across the board, across the board in many, many programs, without being able to pick and choose. If you say to a department head, okay, I need you to cut 2% or 1%, uh, he will say, she will say, well, it's more important to uh, protect this program than that program. We can deal with that program next year. That's not what sequestration does. Sequestration came about because the House and the Senate could not reach an agreement, basically, on uh, a budget agreement. And uh, and the, the, the reason for that is our Republican friends uh, insist that the only way they want to do deficit reduction is by cutting, cutting, and cutting. And at a time when we have already made significant cuts in programs, and a time when we have already reduced the budget deficit by about 50%, uh, it's now less than $700 billion. A few years ago, it was $1.4 uh, $1. trillion. So we've made progress on that. But what many of us believe, you cannot continue to balance the budget on the backs of people like the folks, the woman that Beryl was just talking about, somebody who needs a leukemia treatment. You can't balance the budget by cutting back on meals programs for low-income senior citizens who might otherwise go hungry. You can't balance the budget by cutting... Uh, 70,000 kids off the Head Start program when we need to substantially expand that program. You can't balance the budget by cutting back at NIH research where we need more research, not less. But our Republican friends are saying the only way they want to go forward is to cut, 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 rather than to ask the wealthy and large corporations to start paying their fair share of taxes. And that's the debate. Uh, and that's what drove us to sequestration. The answer is, right now, interestingly enough, uh, Senate, the Republicans were attacking uh, Democrats, why don't you have a budget? Why don't you have a budget? Well, we got a budget. I'm on the budget committee. We passed a budget. No, great budget, but it is a pretty good budget. Does not cut programs for low and moderate income people. Republicans now uh, do not want us to go to conference. Uh, they do not want, in fact, uh, a budget. They want to maintain sequestration and continue these cuts on uh, that are hurting a lot of innocent people. That is good. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. It's our brunch with Bernie hour. Our national town hall meeting with Senator Sanders. We'll be back in just a moment with more of your calls for Senator Bernie Sanders. Check out his website, by the way, at sanders.senate.gov. past the hour. Welcome back. Senator Bernie Sanders on the line with us. Our Brunch with Bernie Hour, our national town hall meeting with Senator Sanders. Ike in North Charleston, South Carolina. You are on the air with Senator Sanders. Oh, man. I've been waiting a long time to talk to you, Mr. Sanders. Uh, forgive me. Uh, I'm out trying to make a living paying the house, so, and I might get a little emotional. Uh, look, here's the deal. I've been working construction for 32 years or better. Ex-union member. I live in the South, so I don't really have much chance of being in a union anymore. Uh, This is my problem, and I've watched it get worse and worse over the years. Every contractor I come up on, including the one I'm working for now, they don't want to pay me other than pay me as a subcontractor. And I've read the IRS code. I know what it takes to be a subcontractor. I've been a contractor. Um, basically they're breaking the law. They're paying me cash under the table and they're not, and they're not paying my taxes. 
and I'm in tax trouble because of it, and it's putting my whatever little money I'm going to have if I should live that long to be able to get Social Security. Um, I need help. We need to stop this. You know, I mean, I work hard, but I don't make enough to put 15% away uh, of my money and pay my taxes on a quarterly uh, on a quarterly basis. And I know it's uh, I know it's going to get me in the end, and I know I'm in trouble now. But is there some way we can stop these employers from abusing people and sub and, and, and classifying us as as subcontractors? Well, I not more than hourly employees. I uh, thank you very much um, for asking that that question, and I want you to know that. The question that you have just asked is reflects the situation that many, many, many thousands of workers are being forced to live under right now. And what uh, what Ike is saying, in case people don't know it, is that instead of being hired as a worker, where his employer is paying uh, his uh, social security tax. Uh, his percentage of, of Medicare tax, unemployment tax, all that stuff. What the employer is saying, you're not an employee of mine. You are a subcontract. You're an independent entity. And therefore, Ike has got to pick up the whole cost, which is very, very expensive. In essence, he's self-employed rather than being an employee. Uh, clearly, we know in the construction industry, uh, we hear this every day that employers are uh, breaking the law, uh, exploiting workers uh, like uh, Ike. Uh, and it is, Ike, all I can tell you, it is a serious issue that we are more than aware of. And uh, there are thousands and thousands of workers being unfairly treated as you are. Um, and and it, it is an issue that we're trying to address. As with many, many other issues, uh, it is hard to protect working people when you have uh, a political party in control of the House, which could care less about these issues, could care less about working families. But it is an issue, Ike, we are aware of. Uh, you are right, and we're going to do everything we can to address it. Charles in Opelaka, Florida. Charles, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Well, hello. How you doing, Senator Sanders? It is my pleasure and my honor to, to speak to you today. I love the work that you're doing in the Senate, and I, and I only can implore that you do more. And, you know, as long as the Lord, the good Lord gives you health and strength. But I have a question for you. Um, I've, I've noticed that the, in, included in the new immigration bill that the Republicans are proposing, that they uh, put a surplus amount of, I guess, border agents or, or insurgents or troops on the border. And my question is, you know, as we can, as you can clearly see, that I, I live in Miami, Florida. I'm, I'm part of the South. There is no industry here that, that provides, you know, jobs, jobs as consistent as everywhere else. And basically, these southern governors are dependent on federal aid for whatever, you know, uh, it is to prop up their, their their budgets. And I'm only thinking that this is just another ploy for the Republicans to get their hands on federal dollars that can be used for something else. And the guys that, you know, they're trying to stop aliens from crossing the border or that they're also, um, you know, uh, stopping the illegals from coming and getting jobs. Of course, they were the ones, I think, that allowed illegals to take the jobs of many Americans. And it's only just another way that they, they use slave labor, you know, to get to gain a profit. And, and the American public had to suffer for this. And, and that's why I think that we're in this economic problem that we're facing today. Well, Charles, thank you very much. Uh, and you made two important points, and I agree with both of them. Uh, I think everybody wants to make sure the border is secure. And, and the good news is, in recent years, actually, we've been doing a lot better job. It, it's tough to do. Uh, but we have made, I think everybody recognizes, uh, great progress along the border. I think if you talk to the governors of uh, Arizona and, and, and Texas, they will tell you uh, that illegal immigration has been significantly reduced. Uh, what uh, the Republicans want to do now is to put billions 
and billions and billions of dollars, as Charles has indicated, into border security. We're already spending a whole lot of money. They want to spend many, many, many times more. They want a whole array of troops. not quite clear to me how many thousands we are talking about. And I think Charles's uh, first point is that this will be an economic boom. There's a lot of federal money coming in. will benefit those states along the border. Uh, and I think he is absolutely right. We should not be naive about it. There's, uh, so that's point number one. And the second point, that these guys were worried about illegal immigrants uh, at the same time in the same bill. Uh, you have uh, Republicans out there, and, and you have some Democrats too, I should tell you, uh, who want to bring in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of low-wage workers in this country so that folks in Florida and in Vermont and elsewhere are going to have to compete against additional low-wage labor. And that's, that's, those are the issues that we are dealing with. It's not a great bill, and I'm trying to you know, figure out what I'm going to do with it. As I mentioned earlier, I've got a youth employment program in there, which will make it a lot better bill. But... You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. Check out his website, sanders.senate.gov. We'll be right back with more Bernie. Tom Harmon here with you in the place where despair is not an option. And this is the uh, Brunch with Bernie Hour. Senator Bernie Sanders taking your calls on the issues of the day. Senator, you're you're with us? I am right here. Okay. Harry in Seattle, Washington, uh, watching Free Speech TV. Harry, you're on the air. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Senator, you know, I've never heard a Republican point out the fact that if everybody uh, who hires folks, if you went to jail for hiring somebody who's not legally entitled to work in this country, uh, people would quit coming across the border. And uh, is E-Verify, uh, the only people I hear pointing that out are Democrats. And E-Verify seems to, uh, it seems to me that if we would just all adhere to this, we could bring the problem to a screeching halt. Harry, I think you make a very, very important point that is not discussed enough. Uh, we hear people uh, saying what a terrible thing it is that for the last 20 years we've had millions of people attempt to come across the border, many of them successfully come across the border. Isn't this a horrible, terrible, terrible thing? They're breaking the law. What we don't hear very much discussion about is the degree to which for many years including under the Bush administration and before that. It was very, very clear that government quite intentionally looked the other way when all of this illegal behavior was happening and basically gave a wink and a nod to employers to say, sure, you want to run a packing house or meat slaughtering place uh, or a farm and you want to hire all the legal immigrants, don't worry about it. Not a problem. You get them for slave labor, not a problem. We're not going to prosecute you. So the blame has always been on the people who cross the border uh, in search of a better life, in search of making a few bucks. Uh, and Harry's point is very well taken. Uh, these people would not be coming across the border, could not survive across the border, if they could not get jobs. And nine times out of ten, the employer knew that they were illegal, and in fact the employer was able to take advantage of the fact that they had no rights. They could not speak up for themselves. So, uh, you know, for many years, many of our law and order guys, the people who just want to throw the, the book at everybody, kind of turned the other way because they had an opportunity to get a lot of cheap labor. And certainly if the law was enforced on employment, uh, we would not uh, have this problem. Dan in Paris, France, listening on WCPT's web stream, you are on the air with Senator Sanders. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, you're both two uh, American heroes and want to thank you for everything you're doing. Uh, just had a question and just trying to see if there might be some type of uh, relationship between what's being proposed right now with the increased border security and the thousands of additional guards and the drawdown of the wars in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. I've w often wondered what will happen as we draw down those wars with all the private contractors as corporations are always looking for new markets. And the question is, could we find ourselves with private contractors filling those roles 
and then effectively end up with mercenaries on U.S. territory? Well, that's a very reasonable question, Dan, and, and I don't know the answer to it. I'm not quite sure that anybody does. Uh, the question and the point that Dan is making, which is a very, very important question, and it has gotten a lot of uh, attention recently uh, with regard to Edward Snowden, who is a private contractor uh, contra- uh, working for a company called uh, Booz Allen uh, on contract with the NSA. Uh, it, it just makes the point that we have an enormous number of government services now being done not by employees of the United States government, but by private contractors. Uh, and the issue is, uh, is that, in fact, a cost-effective way to do those services? Or, in fact, is this a boondoggle by which private companies are making a whole lot of money? And I think, by and large, the latter is probably right. Uh, that uh, in our Iraq and Afghanistan and throughout the military, uh, you are seeing just a whole lot of money going into private contractors, uh, which are doing services that can be done by the government with more accountability, Uh, and, in fact, at lower cost. So I think uh, Dan's point is well taken. Walter in Albuquerque, New Mexico. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Thanks for listening to Sirius Satellite Radio, by the way. Uh, Yes, sir. I'm here. Can you hear me, Tom? Yep. Just fine. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Uh, Tom, can you hear me okay? I hear you fine. You're you're on the air with Bernie. Yes, sir. Uh, uh... I'm sorry, Senator Sanders, thanks so much for uh, taking time with me here. Sir, I, I am so absolutely frustrated and about to pull my hair out that I get so tired of all of the sideshows with all of the scandals that are going on, you know, in the Obama administration, mostly brought on by the right wing and by conservatives. But the point that that's so frustrating is that neither the House nor the Senate are focusing on jobs. It's really so simple. Bring the jobs back, the tax base goes up, the debt goes down. The debt goes down, and America comes back to prosperity. Not the House, not the Senate, not anyone is focused on that. we got all of the sideshows. It is so absolutely frustrating. Well, How do you address... Okay, thank you very much for that important question, I. I agree. We're getting a lot of great questions today, Tom. And I, I agree. Walters is a great one. And people, you know, question after question, hitting the nail right on the head. Um, the most important domestic issue that we face is to create millions of decent-paying jobs. Uh, right now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, real unemployment is not 7.5%. Real unemployment is close to 14% if you include those people who work in part-time, and those people who have given up looking for work. Uh, youth, unemployment is higher f- for young people. Unemployment is higher uh, for people of color, and in some parts of the country, unemployment is just off the wall. Um, and and uh, Walter is right. What the Republicans and the big money interests have had Congress focus on on is deficit reduction. Now, deficit reduction is, in my view, an important issue. No question about it. But the deficit was caused primarily by two unpaid wars, tax breaks for the rich, and the Wall Street caused recession, which resulted in less revenue coming into the federal government. Be that as it may, we have now cut the deficit in half. It is time to focus on creating millions of jobs. And some of the ways you do that, as I've said many, many times, is that you rebuild your infrastructure, roads, bridges, rail, water systems, schools, put a whole lot of people work doing that. You tackle climate change, global warming, by moving away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency, making our homes and offices and buildings more energy efficient, creates huge amounts of jobs, especially if the products are manufactured in the United States. Move to wind, solar, geothermal. We're making progress in all of those areas. We can do a lot more fund small businesses, give small businesses the help they need at affordable interest rates. Tell Wall Street that they have got to invest in America, in the productive economy, and stop their bloody gambling casino, which only makes Wall Street richer. So you do some of the deal with the trade policy, uh, which encourages corporations to send jobs to China. Deal with the immigration issue which stops uh, low-wage workers from coming into the United States. So we can create 
the jobs that we need. And as Walter pointed out, you create jobs, you create taxpayers, they pay taxes, the deficit goes down. Uh, so Walter is right. Now is the time to focus on jobs. Now I will tell Walter that in the immigration bill that we are currently uh, working on, I have a, an amendment in there that I hope will be adopted. I think we stand a reasonable chance to see it adopted, which will put a billion and a half dollars into creating some 400,000 jobs for our young people in the next couple of years. Is that enough? No. Is that a step forward? It is. We need to put all of our people who are unemployed back to work. Work. We also need to focus on the young people who need a foot in the door to start their, uh, their careers. Bill, Bill in, in Great Cap, Cac, Cacapon? Wisconsin? <laughs> or West Virginia, rather? You're close. It's Cacapon. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay, you're on the air with Bernie. With Bernie. Okay, thank you. We're just outside of Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. Um, thank you for taking my call. Uh, Senator? Yup, yup. Um, I, I, my priority, I feel, uh, this deal with Mansoto. Uh, Monsanto? Mansoto uh, Protection Act. Has uh, Congress done anything about that? Uh, that you know, if uh, and I understand, I don't know if it's been proven or not that this generic, uh, which has been thrown out of Europe, uh, generic seeds, is killing the beehives uh, here in the states. Now, genetically I don't know modified. Truth okay, Bill, let's get Bernie's answer. We just have a minute to the break. Actually, Bill, um, what Bill is talking about is Monsanto, a very powerful a biotech company. Uh, that has developed an, a whole lot of uh, uh, genetically modified crops. Uh, I introduced an amendment uh, a couple of months ago, Bill, uh, that would give states the authority to demand labeling, to uh, put labeling on products that contain genetically modified food. Uh, I lost that amendment uh, on, on the floor of the Senate, very strongly opposed by Monsanto and many of the other uh, high-tech uh, companies. Uh, the truth of the matter is that we just don't know enough about the long-term consequences of genetically modified food. Uh, what we do know is that throughout Europe and in dozens of other countries, products uh, that have genetically modified uh, organisms are um, labeled. And I want to see that in the United States. The American people have at least uh, the right to know what is in their food. It's our brunch with Bernie Hour. Senator Bernie Sanders taking your calls. More of your calls for Bernie in just a moment. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. And perhaps more importantly, check out Bernie's website, Sanders.Senate.gov. You can sign up for his newsletter there. It's free and a lot, just a ton of great information. And welcome back. Gene in Gardner, Oregon, watching Free Speech TV on the DISH TV satellite system. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if Senator Sanders has the same notion that I do about the Republicans are absolutely avoiding any job opportunities because that would put... Uh, you know that the social security back in 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 improvement it would also help the economy and i don't think the republicans would like either one of those well gene and what I'm i would curious. say is it is pretty clear uh, that from the first day that obama uh, was elected uh the republicans have decided to do everything that they can to work against him and to obstruct any piece of legislation uh, that would create the kinds of jobs we need, uh, the health care that we need, the environmental protection that, that we need. Uh, for the last four years, we have seen an unprecedented level of obstructionism. Uh, they're not even voting to allow him to appoint judges or other uh, government officials. So I think their record of obstructionism is pretty clear, and the way they see it, is if they can prevent us from making significant improvements in the economy. And by the way, while the economy remains today 
uh, very volatile. Uh, no one doubts that we have made a whole lot of progress since Bush has left office. Unemployment is much lower. The deficit is much lower. Um, but we still have a very, very long way to go. Real unemployment remains 14%. We have got to address it. That is absolutely unacceptable. But to answer uh, Jean's question, I agree with her. I think that if we make progress, the Republicans become uh, unhappy uh, because it, it makes their political task uh, that much harder. Gary in Chicago, Illinois, watching Free Speech TV on their website. You're on the U.S. Senator Sanders. When Obamacare begins to pay doctors by patient outcome, this can be used as a prototype to pay Congress. <coughs> No wars, a bonus check. You know, low <laughs> unemployment, a bonus check. This could eliminate lobbyists. What do you think? Something like this can be done? <laughs> Interesting concept, a, a kind of a merit pay system for members of the Congress. The problem is, um, is that uh, unfortunately not everybody agrees with the goals uh, of the caller. I mean, some would say more wars, a bonus, more tax breaks for the rich, a bonus. Higher, you know, lower wages for workers, a bonus. So I, the problem is I think we, we can't quite agree on, on what the goals are. But, you know, to answer in a more serious manner the, the, the caller's question, I, I, I think there is a widespread feeling that Congress is not addressing the major issues facing our country. Uh, and as I have said repeatedly, um, you know, I think you have uh, right-wing Republicans running the House uh, whose goals are way out of touch with where the American people are. They want to cut Social Security or privatize it, and Medicare as we know it, massive cuts in Medicaid, cuts in education. Uh, and that's where they are. Unfortunately, the Democrats have not been as strong as they should in the progressive whole time. Brunch with Bernie. Senator Bernie Sanders taking your calls live here on the Tom Harpin program. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Tom Harbin here with you. It's the Brunch with Bernie Hour. Senator Bernie Sanders taking your calls. Denise, in what, is it Wadena, Minnesota? Yes. You are on the air with uh, Bernie. Senator Sanders. Yeah, Senator Sanders, thank you. Um, two quick questions. Where are we at with raising the minimum wage, and what do you think the minimum wage should be? Uh, where we are is the president has called for an increase in the minimum wage to $9 an hour. Uh, Tom Harkin and I would like to go above $10 an hour, and I think that's fairly conservative if you look at the fact that the minimum wage has lost purchasing power over the last 20 years or, or more. So there is going to be, I believe, next week or within the next couple of weeks, a I expect within the next couple of weeks a hearing on the minimum wage, which is the way we move the process forward. I would hope that we would have legislation on the floor in the not-too-distant future. So what we're seeing right now are millions of workers working at just horrendously low wages. Uh, I would go higher than $10 an hour, but that's the best that I think we are hearing right now, and uh, I'll be supporting that legislation. Ed, listening on Sirius XM in Altamont, Kansas. You're on the air, Senator Sanders. Thank you. Senator Sanders, it's good to talk to you, sir. Thank you, Ed. Uh, my question is this. I've been injured in two accidents that were not my fault over my lifetime, and they have cost me and my wife our retirement. Uh, I'm sitting at the pharmacy right now, as a matter of fact, trying to decide which medications we're going to be able to buy and which ones we are not. These two insurance companies drug things out on paying quickly to the point that we were broke and had to take whatever they offered to be able to make ends meet. Is there anything that we can do to keep them from being able to prolong it two years 
and bring it down to like 60 days after all medical issues were taken care of? Well, Ed, thank you. That's a very, very good question. And, and I think the issue that you are raising is justice delayed is justice denied. Uh, and uh, what goes on in the country today in, in, in cases, insurance claims cases that you're talking about, but other cases as well, is the people who have deep pockets can hire lawyers, can make appeals, can drag things out and force people who don't have a whole lot of money uh, to make a settlement uh, which is less than perhaps they should have gotten. Uh, so the answer is yes. I mean, obviously we can uh, try to move forward, and it's a very serious problem. I mean, on big cases uh, that goes beyond an individual's claim, uh, these corporations can drag things on year after year after year. So Ed, you raise a very good point, and I think it, 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 as a result of federal and state legislation, uh, we should make sure that that time period is less. Bob in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, watching Free Speech TV. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hello, Senator Sanders and Tom. Good Hi. day to you both. Thank you. I'd just like to say, I'm from Oklahoma, and uh, we, we, we are noted as a gas and oil state. Uh, we've got the biggest Indian tribe in the country. Eastern half of the state is a wooded, uh, hilly western half of the state is flat uh this is great territory for growing hemp and i'm wondering all across the nation now why are we not hearing any discussion of of hemp as a natural resource base for restoring our economy and restoring the environment i mean there's there's just no discussion of it at all on the air that amounts to more than a minute or two before people start rolling their eyes and shrugging their shoulders and giggling at each other. Uh, can we say hemp, as in help end marijuana prohibition, so that farmers all across this country can grow a very easy-to-grow crop that can be used to make all kinds of products and restore our manufacturing economy almost within two seasons? Well, well, well let, let me just uh, say this, Bob. Um, it's not quite accurate to say there is no discussion about it. I mean, right now, I mean, you're talking about two separate issues. You're talking about hemp, and you're talking about, I think, decriminalizing uh, the use of marijuana. And uh, I could tell you that there is discussion about hemp, <clears throat> and I support that discussion, and I support going forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. In terms of um, decriminalizing uh, small amounts of marijuana, states are beginning to do that. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. There have been a number of referendums in states around the country. What is it, Tom, in Colorado where they're now? Yeah, Colorado and, and Washington State are both uh, uh, decriminalized recreational pot. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, you know, not to mention the use of medical marijuana. Right, which is in 20-some-odd states. So, you I know, mean, I, I think there has been a lot of movement in recent years. Uh, should we go further? I think we should. Uh, but it's it's not accurate to say, to say there has been no discussion. The, the only area that I would disagree is I think some of the people who are proponents of hemp think it's, you know, as, as, as I think Bob does, it's going to be the cure-all in life. It's going to rebuild the economy and create all these things. I don't happen to think so. I mean, I think it's another product out there. Uh, I think it's useful to see what we can do with it. But I don't see it as any kind of panacea. But, you know, should we go forward on it? Absolutely. Uh, one minute to wrap up the hour. Uh, Senator, your thoughts on, on the weekend? Well, my thoughts are... Uh, that uh, I hope that people are paying attention uh, to what's going on in Washington. A lot of very, very uh, important issues. Uh, immigration is a huge issue. Uh, it's something that we should have dealt with more effectively years ago. Uh, I am in support, as I said earlier, about many of the provisions in the bill. I am very concerned about the guest worker program pushed by corporate America uh, <clears throat> that, in my view, I want to bring a lot of cheap labor uh, into this uh, country. <coughs> uh, I think also that we have got to continue to focus on jobs. We heard that point being made by several of our callers today. Uh, we need absolutely uh, to create millions of jobs in this country, and we can do it if we have the political will to make it happen. Thank you, Bernie. Thanks so much for being with us again this week. Okay, my pleasure, Tom. Great talk.